I'm Matt Schwartz, president of MJS Executive Search. Today on Dove Barron's Leadership Show, we'll talk about the challenges companies are facing regarding transformational talent and how it's going to drive their success in the future. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dove Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dog Bear's Leadership and Loyalty Tips, where today we're going to take an insider look at gro- the growing trend of transformational talent. What is it? How can you tap into it? If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Tuna.fm, and all the usual places where you might be able to get your podcast. And you can also tune in to us on Terrestrial Radio. You can now find us every Monday and Thursday on, on stations across the United States on FM and AM, including in Lancaster, Philadelphia on 102.1 FM. So come and join us over there too. And also, you can find us on Roku TV on, our, on that channel where we're, we have 100,000 100, subscribers. If you're a new listener, we want to really thank you if, because you've made us the number one podcast for Fortune 500 listeners globally. And with a potential reach of 2.5 to 3 million listeners every show, we're honored to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. Remember, you can also get us on Google Home and Alexa too. Just tap and say played our Varen podcast. All right, let's thank you for thank you for all that you do to get us out there. We really need your help in staying relevant, so please get over to iTunes, uh, Spotify, iHa, all those places, rate, review and subscribe to the show and share it with everybody you know. Okay, so let's let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, sales leader, entrepreneur, leader in any capacity, you know that we have got to stay on top. And that means skills, but it also means that we are looking for people with skills we didn't even know existed 10 years ago. Think about that. Think about how much technology has changed all of our jobs. But how do you find these kinds of people? And just as important, how can you keep them when they are so in demand? Everybody wants them. Well, you're about to find out, my friend, because our guest today is Matthew Schwartz. Now, Matt is the president of MJS Executive Search. MJS is a retained executive search firm that Matt founded back in 2003 after four years at a New York office of Heydrich and Struggle. <laughs> no, it's not. It's Heydrich and Struggle, but I just can't resist saying that. Sorry. Uh, MJS specializes in the placement of transformational talent for global Fortune 500 companies to entrepreneurial startups. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Matt Schwartz. <laughs> welcome, sir. Thank you for having me, Dad. Appreciate it. Good to have you. We'll, 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 we'll let them in on the secret, shall we? This is not our first go at this particular show. <laughs> we, we've had, we had previously, we were all signed up, ready to go. Matt's been waiting a long time to come on the show. But we, you know, we had some technical difficulties. This is part of the reality of what happens, right? We had technical difficulties, so we had to reschedule it. But I'm really excited to have you on because this is becoming more and more of a relevant subject. So let, let's start at the very base of this. What is transformational talent? Because I'm guessing that probably 99% of people listening are going, what the hell is this? I mean, you know, like, do you turn people from water into wine? What is transformational talent? All right. So basically, the way we define transformational talent is 
companies are struggling right now. They're realizing that since 2000, over 50% of the Fortune 500 have either merged, been acquired, or gone out of business. And these companies, any company, whether they're a leader in their industry or a laggard, in order to compete, they need to find the people that have either never existed before within their business, skill sets that are not organic to their company, maybe even their entire industry, or roles that need a significant upgrade due to an infusion of digital marketing or technology. So that's what that's how we define transformational talent. Some of those roles could include big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, uh, Internet of Things, cloud computing, smart grid technology. This is prevalent across every industry and every company across the globe. Well, you know, one of the interesting things about this is that the, the things you mentioned, it's easy for us, particularly if we're on the outside, to think, well, that's not us because our company, because we're not a tech company. But but what you're talking about is not, is technology that's not related or not um, exclusive to technology companies, right? Absolutely, 100%. So if you think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, that is something that when used effectively, basically what it is, it's taking all disparate forms of data and being able to gain information from them, but then also be able you to- You mean put, like, so you can win the election? <laughs> you can win the election, absolutely. Couldn't resist. Um, but, I'm sorry, but, couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, but but more importantly, you can mine that data to be able to have uh, the, the robots or the uh, machine learning actually take control of the situation, eliminate a lot of human interaction, but also mine that data for product improvements, process improvements, customer service uh, capabilities and insights. And, and this is just so, so powerful. So whether it's if we call our bank or um, uh, a travel organization, I mean, it's everywhere. Um, our credit card companies, of course, and it is so powerful. And people are concerned that it's going to eliminate everyone's jobs. Yeah, and that's but, what I was just going to say. Isn't that going to be the fear is like, oh, my God, you know, I don't want anything to do with this because it's going to, you know, we're going to end up with no people. We're going to have this bunch of machines doing the jobs. Yeah, in, in some cases, but sh roles are going to have to shift. Uh, people's skill sets are going to have to shift. We work at the highest levels within organizations, so we're focused on finding the people that are driving this innovation. Right. Um, but we're seeing it more and more that uh, companies, when they think about what's going on to their business, it's either you know heavy competition, um, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, heavy competition, uh, new technologies or um, uh, these digital first uh, startups that are just crushing them. So, you know, Uber is a company that, you know, is one of the largest transportation companies, owns no cars. Owns no cars. Facebook's the, one of the largest content uh, organizations and they really don't produce uh, their own content. Airbnb, one of the largest hospitality organizations, they, they own zero hotels. So, you know, companies that are more of the legacy organizations are realizing that they need to be a lot more nimble and, and figure out how to start competing quickly or they're quickly going to be out of business as well. But, but it's interesting, uh, you know, what you do is you're, you're finding these, these, this great talent, of these people, you're putting them in the companies that are obviously looking for them. But I want to sort of go at it from the other side for a minute. Do mm -hmm. you find that there is resistance, um, not just at the employee level who's thinking about, oh, my God, my job could be in jeopardy, but even at a business level, of, well, we're not that kind of company. And, you know, uh, th th they just don't want to see the writing on the wall. Do, do you do you encounter that? Uh, a, a thousand percent. Right. Um, so in in the case of technology decisions, we would immediately point fingers towards the CTO of an organization and say that person's responsible. But at the end of the day, who is the true chief behavior officer of the organization and the person driving the ship? It's right. the CEO, not yep. the CTO, right? right? So all of a sudden, CTOs have to be responsible. I mean, I'm sorry, CEOs have to be responsible for their company's 
digital and transformation or in some cases complete business reimagination. And so um, you're seeing this more and more where if they take true ownership and they push it down from the top, that's the best way to start the process. But uh, I think during this conversation, we'll have a lot more to talk about in terms of what does need to happen for those companies to be truly successful. Yeah, well, well let, let's sort of look at the the catalyst. What is creating, even forcing the, these companies themselves to transform? Because companies that were about one thing have become about, the, you know, they've had to pivot. They have to mm -hmm. learn to pivot. What do you think is really forcing that? It, it, it's it's customers' uh, changes in taste and behavior. Yeah. Um, most uh, Many organizations were heavily product-centric for many years, and now we're in an age of customization and personalization. Right. So uh, when, now that uh, customers are, are demanding uh, customization and personalization, uh, companies have to turn themselves on their ears, use that data, uh, and go very granular to really understand their customers down to very uh, minute segments and address their needs accordingly. So uh, I'll take the financial services category for a second, and then I'm going to give you another example in the package goods category. Um, in financial services, you and I may be similar in age, um, maybe, maybe you're closer to retirement than I am, uh, maybe one of us has... Um, a higher level of investable assets. Maybe one of us has, we, we have different risk tolerance. Right. So when we go to our homepage of our financial services provider, that should be speaking to us. That right. should be talking about, okay, we know you, we understand who you are and where you're going. Here are some articles that are going to be of interest to you. And here are some investment vehicles that can help you retire more successfully at the, the date that you're most interested in. I mean, in today's day and age, that's something that we expect, but that wasn't what was going on, you know, just a handful of years ago. And when you look at a large financial institution versus a, a, a nimble uh, digital first robo broker, well, that was a very di different experiences. Di di those are very different experiences. Now those worlds are coming together with the most advanced companies. Now, I know you've already got to packaging, but I want to stay with this for a moment. Um, yeah, sure. Because I love that idea. So I, um, just, I'm going to pretend it's my page, so uh, just so I have context here. Sure. Uh, you're, in, you're in a leadership role inside financial business. Mm -hmm. Fred, your mate, your buddy, he's in a leadership role in uh, a labor intensive, like a lot of, you know, employees, etc. industry, that either of you would land on my page, but you wouldn't see the same articles would not come up. It would have mined the data to say, oh, you know, Matt's really interested in financial services. Um, Fred is interested in HR. And it would bring up the article in accordance to the viewer. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I was talking more of a one-on-one -on -one customer experience, right? Um, opposed to just a personalized content experience. I mean, we again, we expect that a lot of places as well. But uh, unfortunately, as we know through what's been going on with Facebook in the last couple of weeks uh, or even months, um, they were spoon feeding us based on you know our profiles, and um, they decided to move much towards personalization of what's going on with our family and friends opposed to uh, a lot of the sponsored posts and things. But yes, uh, we're getting a lot of that and that's all artificial intelligence and machine learning activity. And, and the challenge, I mean, so I, I, as a, as a provider, somebody with a site, with, you know, we get 75,000 uh, new readers every month, you know, it, it, we got a lot of people in there. Yeah, that would be, I can see that as being something wonderful. But at the same time, for me, who is, I'm very high on <laughs> integrity and also on making sure that people are well informed. One of the things that that bothers me is watching how we've built systems that keep people inside of their own bubble. So we used to talk about the Fox bubble or the M MSNBC bubble, the yes. left bubble, the right bubble. But now there's personal bubbles that, you know, as you were just saying, has been built by Facebook. So, you know, this, 
I, what I'm trying to point out here is that as technology is changing and as those jobs are changing, it is a double-edged sword, isn't it? It is. It is. I, I, as a father of two children, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that I, we've all realized, we always knew, hey, if we all watch the same news or read the same newspapers, we're going to be biased in a certain way. But, you know, I want my kids to be free, independent thinkers. I want them to be able to, you know, have their own opinions on things. And uh, by, uh, you know, looking at all the same messaging and, and using all the same tools, it's very hard for people to do that. So, yes, people need to really uh, break out of that and make their own decisions because it's getting more and more controlled as, as time goes on. Yeah. You were talking about the packaging industry. Yeah, package goods, package goods. So I was saying that it's either – uh, services or uh, or consumer um, tastes or uh, business challenges. And mm -hmm. so in the case, uh, we had a client a number of years ago, PepsiCo, they had just reacquired their bottlers. Um, and all of a sudden, they had all of this equipment, vending, fountain and cooler equipment. And they said, well, wait a second, you know, we're in the business of manufacturing soda. But what if we could create what we call retail tainment mm. and turn vending machines into giant touchscreens with facial recognition and the ability to uh, play a video game or sing karaoke with Beyonce before you buy your soda or your, your soft drink? And then from there, uh, uh, not only pay with your phone, but have all those machines connected to the Internet to collect data for manufacturing supply chain maintenance uh, issues, right? So we were asked to uh, recruit uh, engineers with MBAs who had created a product or service that never existed before. So to your point earlier, you know, a lot of companies are looking outside of their core business yeah. to identify people who have the skill sets who can take them to the next level. So the person, the first person we placed in that team was a leader who was one of the creators of Xbox Connect where people are, you know, you're the controller. Right. And he then was leading vending machines at PepsiCo to create this retail tainment where, you know, people could now have an experience of enjoying the buying process of getting their drink versus just, uh, you know, uh, buying something that, you know, may or may not be super healthy for them. But, you know, I mean, I think you bring up something that's vitally important here. We got, you know, you brought two things here. One is something that I call egonomics as opposed to economics, but mm -hmm. it's, I want it my way. Yes. Egonomics. And then the other side of it is that we are entertainment junkies. Everything's got to be entertainment now. Yeah. If it's not entertaining, I don't want anything to do with it. And so whatever your company is, when you're looking for talent, you have got to be looking for talent who can provide this new set of needs because nobody, I mean, I, the great example was, you know, you used well, when the first cars came out, Ford, he said you can have it in black or you can have it in black. Yes. Right? And then, we, you know, then it moved along and we all got to choose and there was a range of maybe even as many as 10 or 14 colors. Now you can actually do custom design online for your car with a lot of uh, car companies, particular uh, certain companies are very specific. You mean these color, just amazing choices. Yeah. Now you're actually designing how your car is going to look that these companies are going to steal the freaking market. Yeah. And the companies that are behind that eight ball are going, no, we don't need that. We don't need somebody who can design the technology to develop the spray paints to do that, to do the machines to do that. They're going to lose out. And a, and a great example of it, um, right in the news very recently, is Toys R Us are gone. Toys R Us, gone. And, and you know, Toys R Us has been a staple for 30 plus years. It's gone. Why is it gone? A, they outsourced their, their online stuff to Amazon. Amazon. Dumb, right? Let's put all our stuff in the hands of the competitor where, they can, where, the, where the shopper can compare us with other people. Not uh. smart, number one. But number two, and I think this is what we're going to see, and, and I really want your input on it from the context yeah. of how people are going to have to adapt, is... Malls. Malls are disappearing in the in the form that they're in. What malls have to become, and what I would even go so far as to say retailers have to become, like Toys R Us, is they have to become experiential based. They have to be the, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk gave the example of holding the world champion uh, Lego con contest 
in Toys R Us, then I want to go. Then I might hang around and buy a couple of things. Yeah. I don't think, you know, and I, I, this is why I think what you're doing is very clever because it seems to me like you are, you and your company and, and the talent that you provide seems to be ahead of the curve here, man. Am I, yeah. am I on crack or are no, I? No, no, you're absolutely thing? right. But I, I want to make a point and then I, I'll tell you something else um, in a second. The, um, I, I heard an interesting term at, at this, uh, I was at a chief talent officer event this week. We were talking about that today we're living in a, a, a digital world, a combination of physical and digital. All right. Yeah. We've, we've all heard of Internet of Things and we know that our search experience is becoming much, much more voice enabled. Yes. And companies have not figured out what that voice experience looks like yet uh, because it's different for every business. But every business needs uh, some sort of voice experience moving forward. We know that's co that's coming very, very quickly. It's in tons of our devices and experiences. Um, but, you know, to your point, you know, the retailers, the malls, it's got to be that digital experience. We want something that's going to interact with our phone, that's going to create some sort of virtual reality. It's going to give us a reason beyond just going to those stores and, and having some sort of multi-use activity uh, within this large building. Because, I mean, I, I know that I live in a very nice area, but only the super upscale mall is doing well. Everything else is going going out, going bye-bye. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing, to your point about this kind of talent, the, the people that are truly the transformational talent out there, the number one reason why they make moves is not because of the lucrative compensation packages, although I'm sure there's plenty of those. Are, they have to pay these people a ton of money because sure. there's small supply and high demand, right? But it's for the intellectual challenge to truly transform a business. And that's what they're looking for. And so the questions that they have before they, they actually take the leap and make the move, they want to know, is this company really ready to make these big bets? Do they have the kind of support infrastructure? Do they have the vision? Is the CEO of the organization supportive of this? Or is this something that's a, a big idea today that's going to disappear tomorrow? And so companies really have to gain that alignment that we were talking about at the top of the conversation before they could ever take these leaps and hire these great people because one person isn't going to do it. It's got to be a whole change in mind shift and culture. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, I can't remember the, the actual dates, but I think it was, uh, I think it was 2011. I, I read a report about, uh, companies that were in the, uh, you know, a blue chip fortune 100, and the eighty percent of them had disappeared, yeah. you know, in a very short period of time. And I, for me, that was economically because of the the, the uh, Great Recession. Sure. But for me, I see that writing on the wall technologically that there are companies who who will be the next blockbuster. You know, blockbuster. I mean, I saw an interview with the guy from the CEO from Blockbuster. After Netflix had kicked their ass and they, they, they called bankruptcy, and he said, we didn't see it coming. And I'm like, dude, if you'd have had a white stick, <laughs> you know, it couldn't have been more obvious. <laughs> right. I could see it and I wasn't in the, tech, in the business. But I think that there is a – I know human beings resist change. We know that. Yeah. But what do you see – like – do you see that there is a big division? Do you see that some people are like really getting on it and other people are like really like I'm not going there? Or do you see that there is a, you know, people are beginning to grasp it and go, OK, I got to do this? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, there is a huge divide between yeah. the companies that really get it and are truly going for it and the ones that are not. And mm -hmm. the part of the reason why some of the companies are not, it's not that they're not smart and they don't identify the issues. It's that part of the reason is that they're publicly traded and uh -huh. the amount of investment that these companies need to make and the amount of people they may have to put on the street to rehire 
the right people to, you know, right size their organization and, and retrofit their organization for the future is a very challenging task. So one, you know, shareholders don't want to see these huge investments uh, going out that, that may take years to recoup. And two, no one wants to see thousands of people on the street, you know, losing their job. Um, and who knows if they're going to be able to hire the new people fast enough. So that that's part of the challenge. So these companies that are being built, obviously, digital first and and uh, uh, you know, real digital natives uh, in the new economy, uh, it's it's easier for them in some ways, uh, although they still have to get recognition and and still be able to find the talent. I mean, I, I I'm keep going back to artificial intelligence and machine learning, but I can tell you from being out there in the market and recruiting a number of these senior leaders, they the folks at Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, it is a land grab. They are sure. hiring every PhD with with this kind of experience they can get their hands on because they don't have enough of them. And they have just a glut of talent that it, it's amazing. And um, trying to recruit those people out they have, you know, incredibly uh, successful stock plans that sure. people, you know, go, they're locking them in with golden handcuffs, and it really makes it cost prohibitive for companies on the outside to hire these people when they probably have to close to double their total compensation package. So, okay, so let's yeah. go with that for a minute. What guidance would you give to somebody who's not Google size, who's not Amazon size? Who says, okay, I get it. We, we, I don't like it, but we got to spend a ton of money. We got to get the right people in here. We got to digitize fully. We need that transformative talent. But how the hell do we compete with Google? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, if it, if they're in Google's market, I, I don't know, you know, they must, they ha would have to have a pretty unique proposition. Uh, in well, order what I mean is when I'm talking about Google. compete with Google, I'm not talking about as in directly compete with them, but co compete with them for talent. Oh, okay. So at the end of the day, people need to find a level of dissatisfaction. Um, I don't want to pick on Google because I, I do think they're a, a world-class organization, but if you think about Google, They've now been around for a while, you know, uh, 20 years or so, uh, close to it. Um, and so they're a huge company. And sure. um, people are, uh, I've, I've talked to and interviewed people from Google. They're, they're a little less enchanted. You know, young kids say, hey, you know, it's a great place to get my start. Great, you know, great learning experience. But we're also finding people at some of these large organizations other than Google, maybe Amazon, others, where they get hired in and, and there's just not enough for them to do or they're not as innovative. You know, things that, you know, were innovative have already been thought out, thought through and, and really picked on. So the more uh, a company can offer that intellectual challenge and that oppor that growth opportunity, the more exciting it's going to be. Also, if they can be a a big fish in a smaller pond, um, that also can be enticing. But again, people are going to have to either walk away from some of these lucrative stock plans or companies are going to have to make it up um, uh, in some other way through sign-on bonuses and their uh, long-term incentive as well. But you said something in there that I think is important for our listeners, who, our viewers who may be throwing their hands in the air saying, well, I can't compete with trying to get talent that Google can get. And I would challenge that because I think that if you look at what millennials want, yeah, they, of course, they want a decent paycheck if they can get it. Why the hell would yep. they? But what they also want is meaningful work. They want camaraderie. They want a community. Yep. And they want to be, as you just said, you know, they want to be intellectually stimulated. And if they're put into an environment where the company's just done a grab of the talent, but we don't really have a use for you, but we'll, we don't mind keeping you around because we want that talent. A lot of those guys, a lot of those people are going to go, you know what, I'm not happy here. And they will jump ship. And so you, to your point, I think that when a company's looking at how do I compete with Google for talent, it's, it's like you've got to create what Google was, which is you've got to create these innovation labs that let mm -hmm. people... Go, go for it. Do whatever you want to do. <laughs> that, that is funny that you bring that up. There, uh, Google in particular um, has a fantastic innovation lab, but 
a lot of what those folks do is they they create prototypes and uh you know it's just they just create all day long and they're not held accountable for anything specific and that yeah. that's something that people either love or they want to be somewhere they could actually build and drive something and so we're we're seeing both sides um but once we realize that in the market, it's become a significant part of our screening process when we talk to these type of innovative leaders because it's a mindset. Sure. Uh, the folks that truly want to just create these prototypes and, and move on and really be a little less accountable for you know producing significant results. When you're talking about this, it appears to be, to me at least, the this is this talent is rarefied. I mean, there's there's not going to be a ton of it. And for you, in what you do in in talent placement, what are the most difficult roles to to fulfill? Yeah. Um, so, so artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence and machine learning is one. Um, sure. They have that. I've read that there's only about ten thousand of those people uh, available, wow. or not available, but out there in the U.S. Yeah, so I mean, it's a small number, you know, relatively speaking. Um, so, so that's that. That's um, a good argument for immigration, right there. Yeah, well, there's a most most of our placements are actually people that were not born in this country, um, with from in that space in, in particular. That space, yeah. I just saw space. I just saw uh, Van Jones speak. You know Van Jones from CNN. Oh sure, yeah, the Van Jones show. And I just saw him speak, and he goes, and he says that he, he cheats at Candy Crush with his kids, and he goes, I like cheating. He goes, and I think America should cheat. And the way we've cheated and won for years is we've allowed immigration. Mm. And, you know, and he goes, if you look at the, the Nobel Prize winners who are American, they're not American. Right. We we brought them in. And exactly. It seems that with ten thousand, I mean, that seems very small to me. Or maybe I'm crazy, but that seems like a very small amount of people to do this growing demand of technologically brilliant and innovative and right. Yeah, and the the number of people that are true innovators in the space and are using the most leading edge tools, uh, that's a much much smaller. smaller number. So we just recently did a search. It took 700 contacts from my search team in order to get one single placement for the role. And that never happens. I mean, a typical search is more like 200 people that we contact to find a slate of candidates. This was 700 to find a slate and then place one single person. So wow. it's, it's a bear. Um, and again, that is the most advanced, innovative, uh, AI leader, not a not a run of the mill uh, uh, data scientist. I mean, there's there's lots of those out there. So um, so that's that. So you were asking um, what other roles? Um, customer experience, user experience. Those are very very challenging uh, positions and in high demand. Um, and then digital innovators, um, in like chief digital officers, or uh, many companies are moving towards a fully agile model where they have tribes and, and squads. So companies like Spotify and ING and Google have moved into this model. And so basically what that means is companies are making huge commitments to completely break up their teams um, and have interdisciplinary squads that can take a product from beginning to end. So if they want to create an experience on on iOS, on Apple or, or Google, they will actually go and create that whole experience within two week sprints uh, across their organization. And then uh, through agile um, testing, will test and learn until they feel it's ready and, and release it to the market. So companies are doing that in a big way, but finding people that truly understand the, the cadence and can manage this uh, truly agile model is, is definitely challenging, but more importantly, people that have the deep innovation skills to understand everything from Internet of Things, customer experience, um, mobile, uh, voice, you know, it's... Yeah. It's amazing, you know, what's going on out there. And, and companies are tending to hire more orchestrators to be their chief digital officers because there's just no way they could have the, the uh, full suite of skills in every discipline that's necessary. So instead, 
They're the orchestrator, the leader, and then they hire uh, interdisciplinary or functional experts to lead these interdisciplinary teams. This is fascinating. So can you share with, with our viewers, our listeners, a strategy or two for them to overcome the, this huge challenge? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So first of all, um, uh, figuring out, uh, well, making sure you have a strong uh, company brand, a, com- a brand that people are going to be super attracted to. Right. If people aren't aware of your brand, you need to make them aware of your brand one way or another. And there's obviously lots of ways through uh, everything from TV commercials like GE did to try and transform their brand to mm-hmm. could be YouTube videos or videos on your website. But it's important that people are really able to get the essence of what the company is all about. Um, two, make sure that the organization has the right alignment um, and that the CEO is is really driving this vision and, and support. Um, three, are they truly invested in the, the right technologies uh, and do they have a plan on, on where they're looking to go? So once you have those things in place and aligned, then you can go out to the market. Um, you, a lot of our clients have world-class search capabilities internally, so they can go and do it on their own. Right. Um, but it's important to have not only a, a great job description that tells the company story, but also the, 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 um, quali- the requirements and uh, qualifications for the role. Um, but uh, one that, that tells that, that visionary story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, you need to be able to communicate that story so people understand clearly where this company is going and what what will be the intellectual challenge that they're going to accomplish uh, and overcome to be able to transform that business. So, I mean, those are those are some key things. But making sure everybody is is realistic and the expectations are in line that if they want everything in the kitchen sink, can they really get it? Does mm-hmm. it exist? And um, uh, what will it cost? For them to hire that person, and that that's where a good search firm comes in to be able to help manage their expectations and uh, you know really have true insights on the market. Because I would imagine where where a company like yours, which is highly specialized, would be so valuable is that if I'm the CEO of an organization, even though we have a vision, even though we're moving towards that vision, even though we're doing all those things, I. Imagine, I'm making this up, but I would imagine yeah. that we don't really know what we need. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I think, that, yeah. like, I think that we won't really know what we need and we probably need some guidance in, in not just finding the right person or the right people, but in knowing who to find. Because I think yeah. that if, if I'm looking in that talent search thing, I'm going to come to you and go, listen, I think we need an X, Y, Z. And you go, yeah, you do for the next two years, but you're going to need an X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, F, G within the next five. That, that, that's very insightful of you. Um, basically, what's what's been happening uh, to us the last couple of years, um, companies bring me in and put me on a firing line, basically, and just drill me with questions uh, or say, hey, this, these are our expectations. This is what we think we need, think right. we want. Go out to the market. And not even we were we wouldn't even have to talk to any candidates, but go and and tell us, you know, what does the landscape look like uh, of people who are chief digital officers at these types of companies? And we, in one case, in particular, we did that and basically came back and said. These are all the reasons why your job description is completely flawed, unrealistic, and the companies that you respect most don't have a, a person that resembles your requirements. Right. So if you were to go to us or someone else or, or do it on your own, we would actually recommend that you go at it this way or mm-hmm. you change your expectations and focus on these three characteristics versus all six to eight characteristics that you've laid out in this uh, description. So again, it's uh, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, sometimes they really don't know what they need or what the market truly looks like um, in these new uh, and innovative areas. Yeah, because I think a lot of it probably feels a bit like science fiction 
you know, and and it's there is a. It seems to me that in placement there is a need for a little bit of predictive thinking, mm -hmm. saying you know, okay, this. I mean, how many? I mean, a simple example. I go back to two thousand, which is you know, for for somebody who's twenty is a long time ago, but it's yeah. not that long ago. And I think about being at the Book Expo America, which is where I was at, and and meeting publishers for my books and meeting editors and they were talking about this thing called ebooks and and it was already taking 10% of the market where is it today it's completely dominated uh, print on demand is completely dominated the big houses many of them have crumbled under under the weight of that we could looking back we go well you could predict that yeah but you know what you could but where it's gone I don't know that you can predict it all. And I think this is the, the thing is that why a company would need someone like you or your organization is because I think there's an objectivity of not being in. You know, I've, Correct. You know, I, I, love the, I love the analogy of, and I'm trying to remember his name, David, he's a poet, and he, and he talked about that there's two, two fish, two young fish swimming through the, through the lake, and they pass an old fish, and the old fish looks at him and goes, all right, lads, how's the water? And then the old fish swims on. And the young fish swim on a little bit further and look at each other and go, what the fuck is water? <laughs> right? Because you yeah. don't know you're in it. Right. Right? And it takes somebody who's got the objectivity and often age, but often objectivity to, to actually make you aware of the thing that you are swimming in. So, you, you know, you're, you, we as companies and as leaders are often swimming in our own problems and we don't see them. And somebody objectively needs to see them, but not only objectively, but predictive and objectively. And that's a, what I see as the greatest value of an organization like yours, even even more than a normal placement agency, because you're doing this transformative talent piece. Absolutely. And, and I mean, don't uh, the other aspect is a lot of these, especially large Fortune 500, they'll, they'll bring in one of the large consulting firms, uh, a McKinsey, a BCG, sure. you know, they'll they'll do some of this analysis. And then an organization like ours will will follow it, you know, once they they have some perspective on, right. you know, how they need to transform their business. So, you know, sometimes they they definitely are w open to outside thinking. You know, it's not all coming from, no, from no. folks like I ours. No, no, but I'm just, yeah. I'm just thinking that, it, you know, it, like we've got to get our head around the fact that sometimes we're just going to be blind. To, we just can't see and we need that outside help. Yeah, it was funny. I was on uh, a call with one of the organizational development folks at uh, American Express a, a number of years back. And at the time, we were just talking about the fact that we did digital transformation work. And I gave her the example of, of PepsiCo and, mm -hmm. and a few other things. And she said, whoa, 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 whoa. She's like, y you do more than digital transformation. You are involved in business reimagination. And I said, whoa, yeah, I'm a search guy, you know, so I can't take it. Take, can't take responsibility for reimagining my client's business. But in some cases, we're definitely their partners in that business reimagination. Absolutely. So I've, I've re-embraced that over the last couple of years because <laughs> we've been very fortunate to help with some some game-changing roles within our client clients' businesses. Now, let's move to the other side of this for a moment, uh, looking at the other side of that equation, which is the talent. The people who are looking to be one of the most needed you know, because that's, of course, ideal, right? The companies yeah. are chomping at the bit. What types of roles should present people be going after extra education for, going to take extra training for, so that they become the in-demand and not the person who's brushed off to the side? So they yeah. part of this major I, transformation. So I, I don't know if I could get so specific, but... Uh, I'll definitely tell you that I, I talk a lot about this and um, I've done some uh, lecturing at my former university and, you know, just I, I tell I, I'm not there to tell kids how to write their resume and no. interview. No, no. I, I talk about how are you going to become transformational talent? And so people need to look out and say, OK, whatever function you're involved in within your business, someone's doing it bigger, 
and better. Some something is being disrupted by technology that is going to, you know, take things to a whole nother level. And you need to be aware of that. So you're not just another cog in the wheel and make differentiate yourself. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine was a traditional um, uh, financial planning and analysis professional. So right. finance guy, um, getting to his mid to late forties, uh, had some good jobs, but found himself all of a sudden out of work. And, right. uh, well, I think he was out of work for about six months and, you know, talented MBA, uh, had been with some great organizations, finally got a job with a world-class company, but had the foresight to say, I need to do things a little bit differently. So in his case, he said, okay, I, I know I'm good with the, the numbers and the analysis, but in today's world, everybody wants to visualize their data. So he learned a program called Tableau, which is one of the most useful uh, decision-making tools for business leaders today. Right. And by learning that, um, he made himself invaluable because he was one of the few people on the team or in the organization that knew that program super well. But then he he opened himself up to be recruited out and became a, a chief administrative officer for our chief <laughs> yeah, uh, for uh, a, a major organization, you know, in our local area. And he is couldn't be happier. He basically said, I transformed into my dream job, you know, and mm -hmm. so People need to keep their eyes open. The days of us working at a company for 20 years, 30 years, 40 um, years, those all are over. over. Right? So those all are over. over. <laughs> and people need to look out for themselves and, and their own development. Um, some world-class organizations are constantly uh, going through a re review process every you know, year, six months, whatever it may be, but not just saying, okay, you did great this year, here's your bonus. Um, but instead saying, OK, what role do you want to get to and what are the skill sets that you're missing and what steps do you need to take to get there? It may take it may, may mean three intermediary jobs in between there within right. that organization or another organization. But at least people can focus on the goal and the deficits they may have to be able to build themselves up and, and get themselves to where they want to go. So so. Matt, give us a give us a couple of uh, warnings. So, what is your warning to talent, people who are in the workforce today, in the context of what you see, the changes you're seeing, and what companies are wanting? Yep. And on the other side, what is your warning to companies who need talent or who are going to need talent they don't even see yet? Yeah. Um, okay. So. Oh, uh, can you repeat the first question? Right, so I'm the first sorry one about is, that. What is the warning to talent, to the people out yes. there in the workforce, in the context of transformational re uh, talent requirements? What's the first okay. one there? Yep. So be aware. Be aware of the future of your company, mm -hmm. the threats that are you know uh, at them every day that are trying to eat their lunch. Um, and make sure that you're in a position to either grow within your current organization or uh, uh, transform to one of the you know growth organizations. So mm -hmm. you need to own your own career, not uh, have that company own you. Right. Um, you're responsible for that and need to take ownership. Um, so that's the first thing. As far as companies, um, companies need to also, be very aware of their competition, mm -hmm. be very aware of what's up and coming. Um, and they need to think about how can we think beyond uh, our borders and be open to being able to be flexible. Um, in today's work environment, people would love to spend more time working from home, have much more flexible schedules, be able to work when they want to work and be with their families. Um, the, the talent that is so highly concentrated in the, the, uh, San Francisco Pacific Northwest, um, those people, if they're happy there, they may not want to move. So can you set up an outpost in that market to be able to get those, that talent to be able to work for your organization? Mm. Um, and then, uh, and then also, uh, make sure you're aware of, uh, 
what you need to do both structurally from an organization standpoint. We talked about the agile structure a few minutes ago um, and the uh, the communication and employee engagement side of the house. Um, too many organizations want to do have big lofty goals, but if that doesn't translate to every layer of the organization and is not crystal clear, it's it's just never going to happen. Did you? I mean, you're part of this, this talent acquisition and placement, etc. Um, is that where you came from? Because it seems like it's very, you know, now it's very, what you're doing is very specialized. Was it yeah. a general sort of talent placement before? So I started out um, in uh, marketing and sales earlier on in my career. Uh, then I moved into search. Uh, it's actually almost 25 years ago, 24 years. And, mm -hmm. and the nice thing about what I did, I, I was very fortunate because the first search firm I worked for was um, focused on transitioning classically trained package goods talent to non-traditional businesses. So in the 90s, it was very much in vogue to get like a Procter & Gamble or a PepsiCo or General Mills marketer to go into financial services, automotive, um, you know, all sorts of different industries, um, even even technology. I mean, everybody wanted that classical training. So it was a good it was a good background early on. And I, I spent five and a half years with that firm before moving over to Hydric and Struggles. And what was interesting there is the large firms are divided into industry focused practices. So I was in the consumer vertical but because I was functionally focused in, in marketing at the time, I got to work across consumer packaged goods, media, entertainment and sports, retail, fashion and luxury goods, and then advertising, marketing, communications, marketing services activity. So when I decided to go off and, and start my firm, I said, OK, the world just blew up. The first dot, oops, sorry, the first dot com boom and bust just happened. Right. And because of that. Companies said, wow, we're, we're willing to spend on marketing talent, but we just spent millions of dollars building brands that disappeared overnight, like pets.com. So we're focused on measurable marketing. So that's where I, I started on that positioning. And it was a lot of direct marketing, database marketing, some email back in the early 2000s. And then we just followed the tea leaves and the, you know, each search helped tell our story. And that's when uh, we started to get some of those unique searches, like with PepsiCo under our belt. And uh, Amex said to us, wow, you're involved in business reimagination. And I turned that into our tagline, transformational talent. Well, the, the, the reason I asked is because you've talked a lot about, about companies and talent needing yeah. to be agile. You know, as I was listening, what I got was the reason you're successful at this is because you've had agility. Yes. That you've absolutely. paid attention and been agile. Yes. And it's a lot of intellectual curiosity because we have to learn about so many different businesses and so many different business challenges. And we get to interview the world leading experts in these areas. So all of a sudden I'm just, we're just sponges of knowledge and we can then, you know, use it to uh, educate folks like your audience, which is great. I That's love it. Fabulous. Tell us, um, uh, the path to, to success is never a straight path. People think it is. And everybody thinks it was easy for you, whoever you are. Um, what was a turning point in for your career? A place where, you know, it, it maybe felt like a devastating crash personally, emotionally, financially, career, whatever it was, that actually made you, a, or eventually made you a better leader. Uh, oh, wow. There are so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um, never one, is there? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, uh, I was in today's world, it seems like everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, at least try and be an entrepreneur. For you me, <laughs> I, I grew up with a father who worked for the same company for 40 years. I mean, he he we've discussed it many times that he he's like, where did you come from? You must be an alien, you know, but <laughs> I, I, I always had that hunger not to work for a single paycheck. I wanted to have unlimited earning potential and, and really bet on myself, but that didn't necessarily translate to being an entrepreneur. So here I was 
um, 32 years old, sitting at Hydric and Struggles, largest search firm in the world at the time, um, doing pretty well. But then the market tanked. Uh, they changed the compensation plan. And I said, well, wait a second. What am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm earning less money than I, I ever have. I, I was earning less money than when I walked in the door based on the, the way they changed the, uh, the compensation plan. Um, but I had a home, uh, a new baby at home, mm -hmm. and I decided to, you know, make that entrepreneurial leap because I knew I could get a job. But I said, you know, I think I could bet on myself. So that that was the first thing, you know, where I, I kind of lit a fire under my belt. And then from there, we decided to have a second child my first year in business. So <laughs> that's a lot of motivation to make sure that you're successful. Because yeah, uh, I really like to feed my child, so we need to go after this. <laughs> exactly. And and 15 years later, my two kids, you know, this is all they know, you know, of me course. owning my own business, which is great. Um, from there... I, you know, I've been through a number of downturns. You know, 2008 was interesting. We are, as you said, a retained search firm. So clients actually pay us up front for our, our services and right. um, rely on us to really, you know, work on searches from beginning to end. When 2008 hit, I was getting calls to do searches on contingency. I have never done a contingency search in my life, never had to, never had to offer it. But something in the mindset of the market had changed. Sure. Didn't mean we hadn't changed, our skills hadn't changed, but there was a lot of fear and a lot of people yeah. were risk adverse to spending money. And so I had to be patient, I had to hang in. Um, and I would say those times of, of, of fear and, uh, uh, and you know downturns are the times that some of the most incredible ideas and uh, innovations in our business have, have come about, you know, whether it's software changes, you know, the ability to just get leaner and meaner, um, be able to focus and go significantly up market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, shortly after that, we took uh, our average fees up uh, close to 100% um, in, a, in a very short time. So, and that was a huge focus effort, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of saying, this is what we do, this is what we stand for, and we're only going to work on the most senior, most significant game-changing uh, searches for our clients. Very cool. Well, we're yeah. coming very close to the end. I just want to ask you, I want to say, I've enjoyed this, it's been great, but if you could give one piece of practical advice to our, to our listeners, to our viewers, uh, that they could put into action... Uh, my preference is always within 48 hours, but even within five working days, what would be that practical piece of advice you would want to give them? Yeah, I, I, we should go back to what I, I said earlier. Um, take some inventory of where you're at in your career mm -hmm. and where you'd like to go. Um, figure out uh, who the competition is, what do they look like compared to your organization? Are you able to drive change within your organization? Can you, or can you drive change within yourself in terms of getting educated and, and growing your skill set? And then, you know, maybe it's time for you to be looking elsewhere outside of your organization in order to continue to build your skill set and get to where you want to go. Very good tip. So, my man. It's been great having you here. Please tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about the services you offer, and all the resources that you have available. Fantastic. Our website is www.mjsearch.com. Uh, mjsearch.com. Uh, we're very active on LinkedIn. Uh, we publish a blog every month. And we also have a great ebook on transformational talent that we're happy to send people if they text MJ Search to 44222. That's MJ search to 44222 and we'll send you our uh, transformational talent ebook. I'm going to write that down. MJ search 44222 is the number. 44222. All right. We'll 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 make sure that people know that. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. It's been a real pleasure and honor having you with us. Thank you so much for all that you've shared. And I want to thank you for that. And I also thank want to you. thank you, dear listener, for uh, joining us today. And uh, 
I hope that you will follow up with Matt and go do research. Go 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 over to his site, take a look, see all the amazing things that are there, including uh, getting getting a hold of that ebook, get, getting a hold of those papers. This we are in a time of change, and if you are slow off the mark, you will be dead in the water. And you don't have a choice. And whether you're a company or an individual, you have got to get ahead of the curve. And I think if, you know, there is a lot of positive stuff that's come out of what Matt has shared with us today, but also is a really, you know, predictive warning that you need to get your ass in gear. You need to pay attention as, as you, as Matt reiterated just a few minutes ago, you've got to stay aware. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive and definitely related to what we've talked about in that these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize they're spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing talent, but they have them leaving them at an incredible rate. If you're sick of investing in training and developing your talent, only have them leave you before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at full MontyLeadership.com, where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. FullMontyLeadership.com, providing the concrete soft skills that you need to get your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. And remember, to get yourself over to the matrix, matrix matrix.FullMontyLeadership.com, you don't need any triple W's, just matrix like the movie dot fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. You'll be able to test yourself in the five areas of leadership and it's absolutely free to you for being a listener valued at 197 matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about paying attention to what's coming down the line, because if you're too slow, you will get left behind. I'm out.